Welcome back, everyone. This is lecture number five. We're going to talk about decision boundaries. So we're going to step away from the uh, the regression version of machine learning, and we're going to take a moment to go back to classification. Um, you're going to find that there's a lot of similarities and a few differences, but we're going to get another chance to cement our understandings of how training and testing sets work and where uh, overfitting falls into the picture and using that uh, matrix algebra again. So buckle up, we're in for a good ride. But uh, first, I do want to check in with you and find out how you are finding this course. So I'm going to ask that you click through to um, the Google form that's linked here. And that's going to get me a chance to get some feedback from you about how the course is going and what your biggest fears are. Okay, so I'll give a pause here to let that happen. All right, so let's talk about classification. And first, before we go into how a machine learning system does it, let's just present a problem and kind of work through how a person might solve it. So there is a fish sorting machine. This, uh, this research comes to us courtesy of our friends north of the border. Lots of fishing going on. And into this conveyor belt, uh, we get a bunch of different fish that are either sea bass or salmon. And the fish conveyor belt brings our item through, and there's a camera which takes an image, and it's the machine is supposed to sort us out to get the right fish in the right piles. So how would we do this? How would we deal with it by hand? Well, Let's, let's look at it this way, right? We know we're gonna collect a bunch of data. We're gonna get all these fish images from a bunch of uh, operation of the machine. And now we're gonna pre-process them. We're gonna make the problem a lot easier by removing the computer vision part. Some magic process or person perhaps is drawing a line around the fish and just getting fish only and separating us from the background we get a bunch of things we can measure out of this. So for instance, this computer vision process magically spits out to us things like the length, the uh, brightness of the image, the width of the fish, the number of fins, all that kind of stuff. And what we're doing is we're making a classifier, right? We're gonna choose a set of rules by hand, which enable us to best separate out sea bass and salmon. Hope you're hungry for fish. All right, we're gonna do the same thing by hand that we would do with the machine learning system. We're gonna train the classifier, we're gonna write our rules from the data, and we're gonna test them on a different set of the data that we never used for actually creating the classifier. All right, hopefully we'll get those new fish images doing quite well compared to uh, the possibilities when we check the generalization. All right, so our first cut at this, we're gonna take a look at the length variable. And maybe we notice that salmon tend to be a little bit shorter than the sea bass. So what if we try to use fish length as a discriminating feature, okay? So in our data set here, which this is our training set, we have uh, the length of the fish and we see how many bass are four inches or eight inches or 10 inches and so forth. And how many salmon are those same length? So when we do our distribution of that data, okay, where we have the, the salmon here in the green and the sea bass in the uh, brownish red there, you can see the distribution across our training set data. And I think you might guess that if you draw a line at some point there, you could say, okay, most of the fish up here are sea bass, most of the fish here are salmon. But when you do that, 
because the distributions do overlap significantly, you're always going to misclassify these salmon as sea bass, and you're always going to misclassify these sea bass as salmon. So that works out to be, in this case, 20% of fish are mis misclassified as the wrong kind. Not too good, huh? So um, we could also notice that the, uh, the bass tend to be a little bit darker, I think, if I've got it the right direction. Uh, no, lighter. So the sea bass are a little bit lighter than the salmon. So maybe we can use the average brightness of fish pixels as a stand-in. And if we do that, we see that, well, the error under these, er the area under the curve over here with the misclassified salmon and the mis misclassified sea bass, sorry, and the misclassified salmon over here, significantly smaller area under those curves. And so when we pick this best discriminating line, the line which gets us the least misclassified, then what we're going to get is a classification error of 8% on this data set. But maybe we can do better by combining the two of them together. If we put length on one axis and lightness on the other, we turn what had been a single dimension of classification into a two-dimensional problem. And maybe we can draw a line right here that best separates out bass and salmon. And it turns out with our training set using a feature vector of length and lightness, we can get a classification error of 4%. Hmm. So, all of that is kind of like a method whereby you yourself actually could go in there and find these dividing lines, okay? You can do it by purposefully moving that line back and forth and seeing where the area is where you get the least misclassification. You could do that iteratively by a trial and error process and uh, write a set of rules, okay? But we want to do this automatically, clearly. All right, so how can we do that? Well, um, we have the definitions we've already worked out for supervised training, okay? So we're off the intuition part, and now we're into the formal math. So there is a set of data which consists of pairs of input vectors x's those x's describe features of the fish they describe the lightness average lightness of the pixels of the fish and the size of the fish okay so those are the two elements in that feature vector now um, we have n of those that's our training set we have n uh, samples of this kind of data all right for again for all of these things x is a vector it's a vector of length m, in this case, length 2. And all of those, uh, those measurements are real numbers. That's what this notation means if you are unfamiliar, right? So x of i, the, every one of those x's is in the real numbers, okay? So the vector x is a vector in m-dimensional real numbers, okay? That's what that means. So y is our output label. y is either 0 or 1 in this formulation, okay? Remember, we could also talk about this as minus 1 and plus 1. There are various reasons to use each encoding of output, but fundamentally for a binary classification, you can choose either for most algorithms. Okay, so let's say that uh, in this case, maybe we want to have sea bass be the positive example and salmon be the negative example. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn this vector, sorry, yeah, this vector W that is going to define the, um, this decision boundary, this line. Okay, so the classifier, the output of the classifier, is a function. It's a function of those inputs x and the current set of model parameters w. And its output 
is the same as our class labels. It can put, it's outputting a predicted class label for any given input. Give it a fish's size and its lightness value, mean, mean pixel brightness, and it will say, I think this is a sea bass, or I think this is not a sea bass. I think it's a salmon. Okay, so the output is either a zero or a one, the same as our labels. All right, so we are going to train this algorithm, all right? And in doing so, how many uh, elements are in our training set? Remember, there are n elements in our training set. So the total error that we get from our training set is going to be, let's run our algorithm forward. Well, let me go out of, let me get out of the way here. Uh, there we go. All right, we're gonna run our algorithm forward. We're gonna use the output, right? Which is going to be either a zero or a one. It's what our algorithm thinks of a given input. So if the true label, y sub i, remember that? The true label in the training set. If the true label is not the same as our predicted label, in other words, our classifier has made a mistake and misclassified, then we're going to get, this is going to be a truth statement, right? If y is not equal to f, then we're going to have a true or a one value in here. And that one value times one is going to be one, okay? What if there is a match here? What if the output of f is the same as y? Well, then this statement is not true, right? It is in fact, equals when our true our predicted is the same as our true label. So we get a false in here. We get a zero, and zero times one is zero. All right. So when we're bang on, we put we get a zero in this term, and when we've made a mistake, we get a one in that term. All right. Well, for every sample in the training set, right? When we go over all n of those samples, we sum those all up. So our error is either a 0 when we don't make a mistake, or it's a 1 when we do make a mistake. And we sum up over all of our training samples and divide by n. So what we get there is a misclassification rate. This is a definition of how many of the training set did I screw up? And if the answer is I screwed up zero of the training set, I'm perfect, then the value here is a zero. And if I screwed up every single element of the training set, the value here is a one. And if I screwed up half of the training set, then the value here is 0 0.5. All right. So in order to get ourselves to have a good algorithm we need to minimize the algorithm's training set error we want to squish away all those errors down to the point where it's not possible for this algorithm to do better on that data all right so supervised error, uh, classifiers do indeed learn by minimizing this training error either implicitly or explicitly um, the Definition of training error is different for each kind of classifier. I've defined for you an error term that makes sense for this kind of classifier. There are different ways to do this task that we have started right here. And when you use completely different algorithms, there are gonna be very different definitions of this training set error, All right? So, but for binary classification, it's what we actually just laid out, right? If you make a mistake here, then this becomes a one, and we essentially find out the mean number of ones across the whole data set. And what we wanna do, again, is we wanna minimize that training set error, so we're gonna minimize this term right here. That's our mathematical operation to do better with, with uh, an algorithm. All right. 
this is just a little aside. This is not a mainline thing. This is a exercise to hone your thinking skills. All right. So we have this definition of training set classifier and the training set error. So what do you think in a binary classification task like we have here, right? It's a binary task. There's only, you know, CBAS or not CBAS. So, and when we have a case where we have an equal number of CBAS and salmon in the data, all right? So you, of your, your data set, 50% of them are CBAS, 50% of them are salmon. So what do you think is going to be the worst value of training set error that we can possibly get out of that system? Have a think about it. I'll give you the hint that some of the key elements are that it's a binary uh, classification. So you might think of if you're really good at stats, a particular distribution, and also that there's an equal number of these in each data set, equal number of sea bass and uh, salmon. All right. I think most of you probably had a think about it and probably a good chunk of you, but not everybody got through it. So the correct answer is one half. You can't get a worse classification, uh, worse error rate than one half. Well, why is that? Well, let's imagine that um, you, if you do worse than one half, okay, let's say that you're systematically assigning like 75% of them wrong. Well, all you have to do to do better than 75% is realize I'm mostly wrong. And if I'm mostly wrong, then I should just switch my beliefs around 180 degrees. Okay. And then I would be getting not 75% wrong, but 25% wrong. So that's, that's fundamentally because it's a binary classification task. And there's an equal number of the two kinds were in this were in this situation so i'm giving you the the intuitive explanation right there's another explanation which involves the binomial distribution i think that if you're a stats uh, oriented person you should be able to work that one out for yourself okay so and if you're thinking in that realm let's ask you one more question to kind of take home with you do you think that you can do worse than 0 0.5 if, for instance, the data sets are not class balanced? What if you have mostly salmon in the training set? Now, maybe I won't make you take it home. Maybe I'll give you one more hint. What happens if your algorithm is dumb and it always guesses CBAS? Uh, you can see there, it's going to make 75% mistakes, right? So you can indeed do worse. But in a 50-50 situation, you can't do worse than 50-50. That is baseline chance. That's rolling the dice or flipping the coin, right? And it's, if it's a fair coin and it's a class-balanced uh, situation, then you can't do worse than 50-50. Nothing can. Not even egregiously guessing only CBAS in a 50-50 data set you're going to be right 50% of the time. But if you always guess CBAS in a 75-25 one, you can be wrong 75% of the time. So just goes to show you that there's several important factors here in machine learning. Thinking probabilistically helps. Uh, and uh, balanced class balanced data sets are often very helpful. <laughs> that is a magic uh, practitioner thing. All right. So let's go the rest of the way with this supervised learning algorithm, right? We've trained the classifier on the training set. Now let's test it, okay? So we have a separate set of testing data, one which was never used to create this decision boundary, all right? So we make the prediction with, these are our test set elements, okay? Those are the values of them in terms of their lightness and size of the fish. So our classifier is going to 
you know, use this boundary to say all of these are sea bass and all of these are salmon. So, and formally, we're going to say that same thing. Okay, here's our testing set. There's Q elements in it. Okay, for each input, we're going to predict its output. All right. And so once we have this, we have a testing set error, right, which has the same definition of error as the training set, except now we're summing over the elements of the testing set, obviously. Okay. So here we have our training error that we've been finding. And we are saying training error has got to be between 0 and 1. Okay. Testing set error we're defining just a second ago. And testing error has to be in that neighborhood of 0 to 1 in that range. Okay. Again, the difference between the two is we're summing over all the elements of the training set or we're summing over all the elements of the testing set. And that's all. We're using the same error definition. And both of these, as I said, are between 0 and 1. And the reason it's not between 0 and 0.5 is because we know, we don't know if classes are equally likely. A priori, before you start looking at the data, they could be anything at all. So if they're highly skewed, then we can do much worse than 1 half. Okay. So in general, you would expect that the error on the testing set is going to be the same or worse than the error of the classifier working on the training set. Why is that? I'll give you a brief second to think it through. So we're going to note that the difference between these testing and training sets we're going to call the generalization error. So if you take the uh, testing set minus the training set, we're going to, we can refer to that as the generalization error because remember we were talking about testing set error as a proxy for the true performance when it generalizes to new examples of the data. Okay. So when testing is much worse, now let me get my face out of the way again. When testing is much, much, much worse than the training set performance, then we can call the classifier as having been overfit. It's overfit to the training data. It's better at dealing with unique features of the training data than it is at the generic problem that we're asking it to solve. Okay. So when is this good? Why is this a good statement that we expect testing set error to be worse than training set error? Or at least no better, I should say, right? So, so you have to realize this is a statement about the long-term averages over many trials of an algorithm on many different kinds of data for any given particular run of training up an algorithm, it is plausible that you will get a situation where the, you could end up with a training set error, which is not as bad as your testing set error, okay? But this is true in the long term over time and data sets. And, and why is it? Well, Fundamentally, if whatever algorithm you're trying to use here has got enough power to learn features of the noise present in the data, then it's going to end up learning elements of that noise. Okay, And if it's learning elements of the training data noise, which is, again, just random dice throws, then it's not necessarily going to be able to apply that understanding to the new testing data, which has a different random draw of that noise distribution. And so it's going to have different particular patterns of noise. Okay, so this is the nature of overfitting. If the algorithm has enough, a low enough bias that it can 
really fit itself to the the patterns of noise in the data in the training data then it's going to be great at that training data potentially even have zero error but it's going to do terribly at the test data and we'll see more about that in several times over the next couple of lectures okay so let's think about this whole deal right that this has to be true on average but could we break it? Are there times when this whole statement isn't true? Well, think for a second about what if the training set is much more complex than the test set? What if the training set has um, a couple of data classes, a couple of labels, right, that uh, are not present in the test set? And what if those two labels, you know, let's call them perch and uh, I don't know another fish that looks like a perch, but let's just say two other fish that are really hard to tell apart. Okay. If that's the case in the training set, it could make lots of confusion. The training set could be relatively poor overall because of that perch and other fish problem. If the test set randomly doesn't have many of those or none of those sample, none of those samples of those two kinds of fish, then we're not going to have that problem in the test set. We're going to do better. So this is only true in general when our test set and training set come from the same distribution of values, when they are equally complex, okay? When they don't have that same distribution of values, then we could get wacky stuff going on, okay? And I'm going to ask you a take-home question right here. Again, this is this is to help build your intuition. This is not the kind of thing I'm throwing on a test, okay? Um, so what do you think is the relationship between test set and training set error in the limit as the both set sizes start to approach infinity? As your, as your training and test set get bigger and bigger and bigger, what do you think is going to happen to the relationship between testing set error and training set error? All right, so I said I'm not going to throw you the answer on that one, but I'll let you work it out or discuss it on Piazza or in discussion section. Okay. So, here's that testing set. As we mentioned, it's going to be equal to the training set error plus a generalization error. And the generalization error is going to be a function of the classifiers, uh, the classifier itself, right? Okay, so let's see here. We have our defined testing set error, and we can think about some really extreme cases, okay? What would happen if we got a testing set error of one half? And we know that assuming a balanced number of sea bass and salmon, one half is as bad as we could do. How would we end up in that terrible case where our testing performance is just chance, where we are really bad at this, right? So there's two ways we can do it, right? So remember, testing set error is training set error plus the generalization error. So if we have a one half, we could get a case like this, where we're equal to a training set error of a half and perfect generalization. Or we could have a training set error of we have zero, which means we're perfect on the training set, and our generalization error is one half. What does that mean? Well, so in the first case, what we're doing is we're really crud at the training set. We're making completely random guesses. In other words, our algorithm is literally just flipping a coin. Okay, a random guess, however, is highly generalizable. You can do that same thing and get the same level of performance 
when you get a different data set from the same process. Okay, well, that's kind of horrifying, but okay, that's one case. So another way we can get terrible test set error is the opposite thing, where we're perfect at the training set and we don't generalize at all. So in this case, we've essentially just memorized the training data. If we memorize the training data, we know the right answer for every single element, but we know nothing at all about the process that made that training data. We're just uh, rote memorization, you know, like the dates they made you learn in, you know, high school history. Okay? So memorizing the data is not generalizable. When you get a new sample from the same process, you have no idea what the answer should be because all you've done is memorize things. Okay. Both of these are trivial and bad examples of things we don't want, right? But they define the endpoints. What we do want is something in the middle, clearly. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so I already said that. We want to avoid that. What we would love is perfection. We're not going to get perfection, right? We live in the real world. So uh, if we get no errors on anything at all, then we've, I don't know, uh, the 2020 has been weird enough. I guess that kind of stuff can happen. But uh, in most cases, what we're going to get to is we're going to get a situation where we get a small error on the training set, or maybe a perfect er perfect one. A perfect performance on the training set is an indication of overfitting, okay? And we're also gonna get a smallish, but maybe not as small um, generalization error. And that just goes to show that the amount here is an indication of the level of overfit we've got, okay? Again, if you get a zero on training set error, you're highly likely to get a relatively larger number here when we check on the test set. Okay, so what we really want in general, what we're shooting for is some balance where we have a relatively low training set error and as low as we can get on generalization error. So here is our classification problem just to remember, okay? We've drawing some boundary, we've got some inputs, those inputs have some, you know, features, and we're outputting a one or a zero. We've got our training set, okay, which consists of a bunch of inputs and labels, and we're training a classifier, okay? And the way we're training a classifier is we're setting a set of parameters W. That is the thing that draws this line here, okay? So the key elements in our fishy example is inputs, the labels, and that model parameter. Okay, we're drawing that line. That's what we wanna do. So that line is known as a decision boundary, right? I've already been saying the word a little bit, but let's be formal about it. So the decision boundary is going to be defined such that this line, the outputs of the classifier are going to be zero, okay? So if we are on one side of this, we know we are a sea bass, and if we're on the other side of it, we know we are a salmon, but on this line, we don't know. We're a 50-50, okay? We have no clue what this thing should be, all right? So let X be this input vector and Y be its label, right? We want the value on this decision boundary to be zero. So the output of the decision is going to be greater than zero when we're over here. And the output of the decision is going to be less than zero when we're over here. that make sense? Also, I want you to note that this version of the line is not going through the origin, okay? 
because there is a term here that's a constant, we can offset this line from the origin, okay? If this C term wasn't here, we would be running right through there, okay? Because that C term is the intercept in a linear equation. All right, so this is our definition again. Key is that if you lie on the line, your output is a zero. So it's a very important concept, right? As I mentioned that anything that falls on the fence there, we don't know what to do with it. It's who knows whether it's a positive or a negative example, okay? Whether it's a sea bass or not a sea bass. So, um, <clears throat> So we know that this decision boundary is the classifier, right? I mean, the classifier is where this decision boundary is. So um, again, typically we're gonna say something that lies on the boundary, the output is a zero. So let's work some examples so you can see the math, all right? So our decision boundary is defined by a vector we call W. And W is a normal vector, okay? This is our boundary. W is a 90 degree normal to it, okay? So we often like to use normalized Ws, which just means that the sum of squares of the two coordinates, right? So if you sum, so if you square these two coordinates and sum them, and then square root that Pythagoras, then that value is going to be 1. So we normalize it down so that the length of this vector is 1. Okay, so if we do this setup that we worked, oh gosh, I don't even know, was that, was that lecture 2 where we worked this example? Where we said that we had a, uh, a uh, rise of, uh, sorry, a rise of 1.2 over a run of 1, right? then we know this relationship is true, and we can work backwards from the normalization of the w vector to get these exact values, okay? So the distance of any point to the line is how we know whether this is a, a C bass or not a C bass, right? So remember that if we take w and we do the dot product with the input, we're going to project the vector of the input onto the normal. We're going to find out how far are we along the direction of the w. Okay? So this is a distance, okay? When you are below the line, we say this distance is negative. And when you're above the line, we're gonna say this distance is positive, okay? So above means pointed in the same direction as that normal, all right? So wherever this normal is pointing, that's the top, that's the positive direction. And the direction down here is the negative direction, okay? So that's a convention that we're gonna follow, okay? So this is a positive distance and this is a negative distance. But in both cases, the distance is defined as the dot product, which is projecting the x vector, right? The vector that defines where the x point is, and we project it onto w, okay? That is the distance. So we can also formulate this as a cosine. So in this case, the angle here, theta 2, right? So the cosine of that is going to define, uh, so cosine is uh, so co adjacent over hypotenuse, right? So the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So do that and you get the x value and the, uh, sorry, the magnitude of the x vector and the a w vector projecting onto each other.
So and you can do likewise in the positive direction. Okay, so that's just an alternative formulation. I like to stick with the dot product. It makes my life easier. Okay, here's another one of those intuition questions for the math to try to get you to be able to think more with this kind of problem, right? Again, so let's look at the formulation we've had, okay? We're saying that the decision boundary is of the form w transpose dot product x, okay? Can that decision boundary definition, which be used to describe this red line, okay? We give it a w vector looks like this. Can we describe this line with this equation? You might have already guessed no, because I'm probably pretty bad at the poker face, right? Okay, why not? Why can we not do that? Any guesses? Back row? Okay, well, the answer is no. Why is that? Well, so, the decision boundary that we defined had the wrong, whoops, had the wrong format, okay? To have any offset from here, right? If we were, if we're just using w times x, w dot x, we have to be running through the origin, okay? We need to get anything that's not running through the origin, we need an intercept term we need a bias term, okay? So let's formulate a more general version of this, okay? Now we're gonna say our decision boundary has not just a wx term, but also a bias. We're gonna let our decision boundary move off the origin. We get our intercept, okay? Other than that, we're in the same situation, right? W is a two-dimensional weight vector in this formulation. X is a two-dimensional input vector. And our bias term is a real number, as are all of these. These are all in real sub n. Okay? So now, because we have a bias term, we can move this decision boundary off the origin. We can push it any way we want. And again, anything that's in the uh, positive area, we define as when wx plus b is greater than zero, okay? So anytime that projection onto the normal vector is telling us we're on the same direction as the normal vector on that side of the line, then we are in the positive area and this is a C bass, okay? And anytime we are down here where we're on the opposite direction away from the normal vector, then this is the negative area and this is a salmon, okay? And in this case, the w, the projection of the x point onto the normal of the w, okay, plus the bias term is gonna be less than zero. This is going to be a negative number down here, the distance, and the distance up here is going to be a positive number, okay? Here's our w vector. For convenience, we could still write it at the origin or we can write it here, but the point is, is that it's that direction that matters, okay? So when we get an x point, oh, sorry, and b is down here, right? b is the offset. Okay, so we get our new x point, we're gonna Take the vector that defines x, and we're going to project it onto w using the dot product. And we're going to find out this is wt sub x. wt, right, w transpose, dot product x. Okay, this whole distance, that projection. Well, 
but we have a bias term there. So this is wt of x, w transpose dot x plus the bias term. All right, the decision boundary can go through the origin if you don't have a bias or if the bias is equal to zero, right? And when bias is going to be in the, uh, it's going to be a, a positive number, then the decision boundary is moved along opposite W, okay? A positive bias moves the, the boundary down, okay? A negative bias moves the boundary in the same direction as W, it moves it up. Okay. So let's, let's work a couple of examples quickly. We're getting kind of close to time, but I think we can get through them. All right, so let's assume we have a normalized vector. Again, that just means that the magnitude of the vector is one. Okay, so we have our vectors and we have a bias. They're all in the reals, our inputs likewise. Okay, so let's start with a vector that is zero in x1 and one in x2. Okay, that means we're pointed straight up. Okay, so as I promised, our w vector points straight up, and because w is the normal, that means that the decision boundary lies horizontally. And the bias is zero. Because the bias is zero, that means we run through the origin, right? So if we run through the origin, we've got a horizontal line right there on the x-axis. Now you plug those numbers, 0 and 1 in here, 0 times x plus 1 times x2 is equal to 0, right? All the zero, the 0 drops out there, and that means that we have x2 is equal to 0. And that shows you that the decision boundary, when you set the, right, when you set the output of this equal to 0, that's the definition of where the decision boundary is, okay? So positive area and negative area. Pretty simple, about as easy as it gets. Okay, so let's do another one. But this time the bias is minus two. So everything is in the same orientation, but the minus two bias means that the decision boundary moves towards the top. It moves with the w vector. Okay, so it's two up from the origin. And so that's your positive area up here. And down here is your negative area. Okay, again, everything that lies along this line, wt, the transpose w dot product of x plus b is going to give you a zero all across this region, all across that line. And positive numbers up here and negative numbers down here. And you can just go ahead and run that um, run that set it equal to zero thing, okay? So we have zero x plus one times x two minus two. So that equals to zero. Things drop out, you end up with x two minus two is equal to zero, which means x two is equal to two when you pull it across here and that's how you get that line. Pretty simple, okay. So again, remind yourself that the decision boundary itself means anything that lies on it, you don't really know whether it's a positive or a negative case, okay? That's the key of the whole thing. So in a linear model, the decision boundary is a line in the spaces we've been working with. But if you take it into n-dimensional space, instead of into two-dimensional space where it's a line, in a three-dimensional space, right, what you've got is a plane, okay? So now we are gonna be separating out things by putting a plane through the middle, 
hey, here's my plane. Okay, so in my three-dimensional space, everything that lies on one side of my iPad is class A, and everything that runs on the opposite side is class B. Okay, and you can extrapolate that into four-dimensional space and so on and so forth. When we go above, uh, you know, three dimensions, we talk about hyperplane. Okay. Typical machine learning, you're going to have more than three variables. You're going to have 300 variables. So you're always going to be using hyperplanes, things that are very difficult to visualize, but conceptually it's no different than a line dividing the two dimensional space or our plane di dividing the three dimensional space. Okay? So that's what that word hyperplane means. It's a plane projected into four and higher dimensions. Um, there's a really cool book about uh, computer graphics that I'm blanking on the name of that really helps you visualize uh, high dimensional geometries. It's, I'll throw the uh, link up on Piazza at some point. It's kind of fun. All right. So again, W is our model, and the parameters define the direction normally, okay? They define the normal direction to the boundary. There's a bias term, which is going to shift our boundary back and forth, right? And when the bias term is negative, it shifts the boundary along our normal. And when the bias term is positive, it brings it backwards, okay? Note that that is not itself the decision boundary. W is not. It's the normal to it. Okay? Contrast that with regression. Right? When we did regression, W defined the direction of the regression. It defined the slope. Right? That would be parallel to the decision boundary if you were using the same notation in classification. But we're not. This time we're using that normal because what we're interested in is how far away you are from that decision boundary. Because if you're far away from the decision boundary, you're probably highly confident in your answer about what class this point is. But if you're close to the decision boundary, you may be less confident. And that will give us an alternative formulation for this at a later date. Okay. So just a couple of more quick examples. Uh, so if we do the same thing, but we just, we just give you more examples, right? So you can feel comfortable. What if we take a vector which is minus 1 and 0, right? So what's going to happen is we now have a horizontal normal and a vertical decision boundary, OK? This looks exactly like the other case we just showed you, right? You've got a positive example, a positive area and a negative area. And the math works out exactly the same. It's just that we've flipped what, which one of x1 and x2 is a zeroed vector, OK? And it's the same math. We can show that x1 has got to be equal to 0 and that when we set the decision boundary. So again, you want to know where the decision boundary is. That's the point where the w vector projects to zero length. So we can do the same thing again, but this time with a bias term, just like the last time. So now the bias being positive, we've moved away from the normal. Now we have this positive area, and that is the area where that w transpose dot onto whatever x we're dealing with plus the bias term is going to yield a positive number over here and here it's going to yield a negative number for the the distance is signed okay all right so as i mentioned pay attention to that bias term because the value of a negative bias moves the boundary with the normal vector. And the value of a positive bias, right, 
moves away from the normal vector. So when B is negative, decision boundary moves with the normal vector, and when it's positive, it moves backwards. Okay, last example. I can already hear papers rustling at the back of the lecture hall, and people have already left. Only about a third of you maybe are sitting still and paying attention at this point. All right, so we have our same setup, but now our W, oh my goodness, it's not just aligned on one of the axes. It's actually, you know, got a tilt to it. So we define our decision boundary. The minus one means that we are tilted towards that quadrant, towards the uh, first quadrant, right? It's been so long since high school math. And we define this, this point, the math of W transpose times X plus the bias term has got to be equal to zero for everything that lies along the decision boundary. So doing the math that way means minus X1 plus X2 equals zero. So everything up here has got a positive projection. Everything down below has a negative value when we project. And for the last time, we're going to do the same problem, but we're going to add a bias term, okay? which is going to do the same deal, but we're going to shift the boundary by that bias term, which is a negative, so it shifts along the direction of the W. Positive area up here, and we get positive values for the projection, negative values down here. So, what is the take home message off that, right? Data points lying along the boundary are, we don't knows, okay? The boundary itself is a hyperplane in an n-dimensional space, okay? And the model parameter w is always going to be pointed in the normal direction of the positives. Okay, These are all conventions. You can set up the math differently, but this is a standard convention, and it's going to make a lot of sense as we talk about this kind of uh, thing in other classifiers like SVMs. Okay, That bias shifts things right? in any direction we want. So here is the n-dimensional space version of it, right? I, I actually, let's just skip this because realistically this is a terrible drawing. And I think the intuition is more important at this point, right? That we can take the same thing into three-dimensional or even higher spaces, okay? You've got a point which here lies below the plane, okay? And we do the three-dimensional projection in this case, and we get a negative value for this projection of Wx plus b. And up here, this point lies above the plane, and we get the positive value on the projection. Above and below the hyperplane. So the final recap. This is the math of classification and it's gonna function for us everywhere we go. The formulation we've made is completely general. It doesn't matter how many dimensions we have. It's the beauty of linear algebra. Just make the vectors bigger with more dimensions and it's all the same, okay? And the intuition is we draw this line, stuff on the line, we don't know what's up with it. Stuff this direction, we know it's one class, the negative one, and this direction, we know it's the positive class. All right. For the two of you that are still in the lecture hall at this point, I thank you very much for paying attention the whole time. Uh, the rest of them are just going to, you know, watch the video and catch up. All right. Thank you very much for your attention. I will look forward to chatting with you in office hours or on Piazza or on Wednesday lecture. Have fun.